Okay, well, thanks for giving me the opportunity for an application talk. Usually I talk more uh, pedantic, didactic lectures about fluorescence, so this is a little different. Um, and those of you who know me know for years we've worked on the protein dynamic with my friend Joe, but now we have something a little different to talk about. So before I begin, I want to thank all of us in the United States. Happy Thanksgiving Day. And hopefully we'll all be having some Thanksgiving dinner later today. Okay, so first I'm talking about the protein arc. So what is arc? Well, arc um, is a, stands for Activity Regulated Cytoskeletal Associated Protein. It's also known as ARG 3.1. It's a key regulator of synaptic plasticity. and is actually required for formation of long-term memories. So in response to neuronal activity, um, our protein level increase rapidly within minutes in dendrites um, and more slowly within hours in nucleus. In dendritic spines, it promotes long-term depression and synaptic weakening by facilitating endocytosis of AMPA type receptors. And I'll get into that in more detail. Um, also uh, in the nucleus involved, as I said, in uh, gene transcription and other things. So remember about uh, neurotransmission, glutamate neurotransmission is critical for learning and memory. So um, we have the vesicles releasing glutamate and these are sensed by receptors. Then uh, I'm gonna specifically focus on the AMPA receptor. Synaptic strength is controlled in part by the amount of AMPA receptor on the dendrite surface which is of course controlled by the balance between AMPAR, AMPAR endos, exocytosis and endocytosis. So ARC reduces the synaptic strength by promoting endocytosis of the AMPAR receptors in the spines. And that's illustrated here. And uh, we might wanna note that overexpression of ARC, and of course, a lot of studies have been done in, in mouse models, but overexpression can lead to cognitive disorders um, like Alzheimer's disease and uh, fragile um, X syndrome, but I'm not gonna go into those parts. But in 2006, potential binding sites on ARC uh, were found for endophilin and dynamin. Now, since our lab with Joe Albanese and I have worked for dynamin and endophilin for years and years, this report caught our attention. In fact, the structure of the C-terminal donaeum of ARC was solved by X-ray crystallography and found to be almost superimposable on the structure of the HIV gag domain, which is shown uh, up here. And we'll get more on this later because that turns out to be very interesting. But let me refresh your memory on what dynamins do. Dynamins are about 100 kilodalton GTPase pinchases that catalyze vesicle budding. So you get a vesicle forming at a uh, for example, here we show a clathrin-coated uh, pit, and the dynamin is important to, when it hydrolyzes, to clip off the vesicle. Okay. So our first entry into this field was, uh, we showed with Joe's group, and Chris Beyer was the grad student involved here, um, that ARC definitely enhanced dynamic polymerization and GTPase activity. And this was very dramatic. And we thought it was interesting because you're seeing the consequence, not just putative binding, but that ARC really does affect dynamic too, in particular um, at physiological ionic strength. But then later, two papers came out that changed the way we think about ARC. Namely that, again, going back to this retrovirus like gag protein domain, that um, this was involved in, uh, um, it, it was reminiscent of, remember, the, the gag protein is the famous viral protein, and this had some uh, viral properties. So specifically, we did some early electron uh, microscopy, negative staining on the left, and we saw these particles, okay, which we certainly never looked at as potential virus, but then Shepherd's group later on did cryo-EM and they identified a lot of beautiful particles that they correlated very well, they thought, with, uh, with virus type particles. And the idea was that 
uh, Shepard and, and others have that uh, ARC oligomerizes in the virus-like particles that contain ARC messenger RNA. These can be released from the host plasma membrane as extracellular vesicles and then internalized into neighboring cells. And Shepard showed this by actually growing cells expressing ARC and collecting the medium, it's not the cells, but just what was in the medium, and then introducing that to cells that absolutely did not have ARC in them, and then they, they then started expressing ARC. So this mechanism seems to be real. In fact, it really caught the attention of the popular press for a while as articles appeared about this, how brains, now, of course, this is the popular press view, share information. This even was in Wall Street Journal had an article on it. So Shepard got a lot of uh, popular press on these ideas. Now we had showed with Joe's lab that uh, art can be palmitylated, okay? Which is obviously important when you think about something localizing to membranes. And here on the right, we see the, the, the structural domains of arc. Again, you have that capsid-like, gag-like domain on the right. But I wanna also point out, we have uh, the dynamin binding domain, the endophilin domain, AP2 binding domain, which is another endocytic protein. And because of uh, Belen's talk earlier, I wanna point out that there's a presenilin one domain two, and that's the enzyme, of course, responsible for clipping the APP into the a beta peptides that she talked about. So there's even a connection to that. Now, we first show that ARC binds directly to phospholipid vesicles, okay? And we can see binding curves, just pull down assays that uh, it binds stronger to false lipid preparations, total brain extracts, and but also to pure, uh, phospho, pure PC vesicles. So then we, of course, thought to do GUV work and began to explore this question with Lionel when he was still at the LFD using the famous GUV systems. And here you see uh, our first image. And it, for those of you that know GUVs, you can even see these are when we had a bound of the platinum wire. And we labeled our covalently with Alexa 594. And I want to add that I think Leon, I was very impressed because he had never labeled a protein before. But at any rate, we went through that, and that was fun. And you can definitely see on the on the cell surface uh, from this and many images that ARC would bind to it. But then the next thing, when Leon started to do uh, GUVs with Lordan with ARC, that was really the the big thing for us. So Leon got this picture of a GUV label with Lordan after addition of ARC and. I think it's just beautiful. You see all these internal vesicles, okay? And moreover, because he did this on this ice with the spectro imaging, you could see that the internal vesicles, the Lordan is in a more fluid state than on the, on the, on the outside one, on the main GUV. So that, we, that was really something. And I think that image and that image alone helped Joe Albanese and I to get an NIH grant with then we had Nick Hetty started collaborating with us. So here's some more of the work that uh, Leonel did. Again, many, many cases, you see these beautiful internal vesicles. And when you look at, look at where the arc labeled with Alexa is, you can see that it's inside in the, in the vesicles. So that was interesting. But then Nick continued this GUV work and he did a lot of, a lot of vesicles. And here you see DOPC with Lordan without the arc. And when you add the arc, and he studied the time course, et cetera, et cetera. You, you see formation of vesicles again and again. But he did a lot of studies to actually get some statistics. So you can see without the arc, you only have a few that form, uh, show some internal vesicles, not those nice, beautiful ones we saw before either. But when you have arc or um, by itself or Alexa labeled arc, then you both cases get a tremendous increase in the number of internal vesicles, GUVs with internal vesicles. And we had different controls. We even put in EGFP to show that another random protein doesn't cause this. I think we had some other ones too. But at any rate, this is a real phenomena. And we just recently published a paper on this, um, membrane remodeling. So that just came out. So our current thinking is, about ARC, R meaning, the, I guess, the field. ARC is involved in processes that require either positive curvature, this would be the AMPA 
receptor endocytosis or negative curvature, which is like the uh, release from the membrane, like the GUV case. And it's interesting to note that in the aporeceptor endocytosis, you need the whole endocytic machinery, the dynamin, endophilin, AP2, et cetera, et cetera. But in the release of the vesicle release, like with the GUV, ARC can do it by itself. And there's other cases of some viruses that can, that can do that um, to cause release of those uh, negative curvature vesicles. So in living cells, as I said, in the synapse, ARC facilitates endocytosis of AMPA receptors. In the nucleus, it regulates transcription of genes involved in learning and memory. So we were interested in both in the cytoplasm and the nucleus. So we started to do the usual array of nanoimaging methodologies available at the LFD. Here we looked at the RICs for ARC in the cytoplasm and the nucleus, and you can see it definitely was more mobile in the nucleus than in the cytoplasm. It's fairly slow in the cytoplasm. Presumably it's binding to other proteins or structures like small vesicles. We need to explore that some more. But in the nucleus, we were interested, what other differences are there? Well, we looked using N and B, and this is great in this workshop. I don't have to discuss how these methods work, okay? You all know that now. So in N and B, you could see that, um, especially in the cytoplasm, you could get higher order oligomers in the nucleus. It was much more leaning towards monomeric states. But we follow that up with FRET. And again, here's the famous phaser diagram for FRET between EGF, we expressed EGFP alone, but also then EGFP ARC with uh, ARC M cherry. And you can see by that phaser diagram, there's definitely energy transfer. You all recognize that signature now. But interestingly, when you look at the energy transfer, you see the EGFP is throughout the cell, but the energy transfer occurs mainly in the cytoplasm, very, very little, if any, in the nucleus. And that leads us again to believe that ARC is more monomeric in the nucleus. And again, this is still a works in progress. We need to explore that, okay? Um, now, interestingly, a major pool of ARC associates with promyelocytic leukemia nuclear bodies, PML nuclear bodies, which you may remember face separated membraneless organelles involved in, among other functions, epigenetic control of gene transcription, okay, in the nucleus. And people had seen this a while back here, a 2007 paper where they had ARC EYFP, and then the PML, they had fluorescently labeled antibodies to that. But Nick Hetty did this more recently with PML labeled with EGFP and ARC M Cherry. And you could um, see signals, of course, of both of these in the, in the PML nuclear bodies. And then Nick did some FRAP analysis, which was kind of fun, I thought. And here you can see on the left the, uh, where he, uh, the different PML nuclear bodies that he FRAPed. And here on the C, we see the pre-bleaching, and then when he bleaches it, it's a very, very, very slow recovery of the PML EGFP. However, the M cherry recovers very quickly. I mean, you can see the difference in time, oops, between the recovery of the uh, M cherry and the PML, which tells you that the M cherry can exchange out into the, uh, in and out of the uh, nuclear body, but the, the PML EGFP is much slower. We then wanted to see if we could see barriers to the motion of ARC. And we did the famous two-dimensional spatial pair correlation function. So you see virtually everything we talked about in the early part of the course, we did this. And this of course was done again by Nick Hetty at the LFD. And it was quite clear that M. Cherry um, in the, uh, inside the nucleus had very few barriers. It was pretty much isotropic diffusion, but outside there really were barriers, okay? And the anisotropy of the motion outside was very distinct. And it, you remember you're seeing those little lines there showing barriers of diffusion. So we think that inside it's free to go around the, the nuclear body, but when it's outside, it's, up, it's, obstruct, it's finding obstacles to diffusion, presumably, things perhaps to do with the heterochromatin structures, okay? So uh, 
obviously this too, we'd like to explore some more, but you can see the utility of these methods to explore these type of questions. Now, I also said that ARC and Dynamin cooperate to regulate actin cytoskeleton and dendritic spines, and I really don't want to spend the time to go into this. You can see with ARC is enriched and actually causes a formation of philopodia. We have some movies, but I don't have them here. But uh, you can even see actin whiskers, and these are studies Nick did with Life Act, which you know is a peptide that binds to actin, has a GFP attached to it. And you definitely see more of these little whiskers um, resemble um, actin whiskers, which are like thin philopodial dendrites on the arc treated cells. And I mean, you just have to take my word for it when you do a lot of them. Here's where we maybe need Federico's uh, machine learning programs. You can really see uh, uh, that these form. So that again needs to be studied more. So again, this relates to the possible mechanism for intracellular arc transport, not just releasing the vesicles to the outside, but maybe tunneling through the philopodia. Because in here, you, you do get arc is in the philopodia. Okay, so that suggests this sort of possibility. Again, something to explore. So obviously, we have a lot more to do. This is still early days. Um, we know that... Uh, Archelomerization, we've characterized a lot in, in vitro, but stimulus-dependent changes in oligomerization of arc in neurons or neuron-like cells remains to be explored. Mechanisms of nuclear transport in association with nuclear binding partners needs to be explored. So fortunately, there's a lot we can do. Now we just need to get another grant, which we keep applying for.